Taylor Salisbury and I'm a lecturer in Global Mental Health at King's College London and a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. Today I'm here to talk to you about how I'm integrating human-centered design into my global mental health work. So let's first think about this challenge. So every single day there are 200,000 babies born to adolescent mothers. The majority of these young girls live in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Mozambique, where my research is focused, 42% have a baby before the age of 18. This puts them at having the fourth highest global pregnancy rate amongst adolescents. Now, we know that having a baby early has a significant impact to the social, physical health, um, educational and employment opportunities um, and outcomes for young girls. It also has a significant impact on their mental health, unsurprisingly. It's estimated that one in three girls will experience a mental health problem during pregnancy or the year after birth. Now, most of the effort globally has gone into the prevention of teenage pregnancy, which is important in its own right. But what this does and what it has done has meant that girls who do become pregnant and are highly vulnerable have been left behind um, for the most part. And we know that the mental health issues that they might experience also impact and result in negative outcomes, again, for their physical health and maternal complications, um, the development of their child, uh, as well as opportunities for education and employment in the long term. And as the rates of global teenage pregnancy are reducing, some might think that this is a problem that we don't really need to deal with because there'll be so few um, girls that this will affect. However, we do know that with the rise in population, this will mean that actually the numbers of girls becoming pregnant in their teens uh, is set to increase uh, in the future, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And despite the vulnerabilities and the things that we know, there are very little interventions that have been focused on mental health for girls during pregnancy uh, and the year after birth. And none of these interventions that do exist have actually been tested in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a real problem here with the way in which we're making interventions available and also, I'd say, in the way that we're developing these interventions. There are interventions, and, and the literature is, has been growing um, over the decades for global mental health. Um, however, we don't usually see very many of these mental health interventions in situ, so outside of a research project. And if we think about it, one of the reasons I believe that this is the case is because we're not actually taking into consideration the motivations, the experiences, the priorities, the challenges that are faced by young women and the communities in which they live. And so these interventions lack a relevance and a resonance with them and the service providers. And as a result, we don't see them. So what I'm focused doing um, is incorporating a human-centered design approach to global mental health. So what exactly does that mean? So human-centered design is, it's a type of co-design, but it's a well-structured approach uh, to developing interventions. And the great thing is that it starts off with the individuals. What are their experiences? What are their challenges? What are their priorities? What are their needs? And then the intervention itself is then very much built around that. So it's embedded within the culture and the context of the community, and also is something that is done in partnership with these stakeholders or partners, 
um, so that they are part of the development of the intervention and the implementation and the evaluation. So their voices and their needs in all of these stages are just as important as the clinicians or the researchers. And this is really important because what it does is it places these stakeholders, these really important um, partners who are integral to the demand and the supply of an intervention right at the front. So no longer are they seen as a group of people that you consult with at the end of the development um, or even evaluation process to just rubber stamp things, um, or where their comments and concerns and considerations are actually not really integrated or implemented into the refinement of an intervention. And what this actually does then is that it increases the acceptability, the appropriateness, and the feasibility um, and then as a result, the sustainability and scalability of these interventions, because we have the stakeholder buy-in and they really want to be part of this. So this might seem like something that you have never heard of before or isn't part of your lives, but really it's part of almost all of our lives. Human-centered design is an approach that um, began in the private sector and is very much used today by companies to create new products and solutions to the challenges of everyday life. So firstly, you can take Airbnb. Um, that was a company that really was built um, using a human-centered design approach and is doing quite well. Um, also, there is Apple, and they are a company very well known for using human-centered design approaches in the development of their products. And lastly, kind of more uh, low tech, is the design of the Heinz ketchup bottle. So if you remember the original glass ketchup bottles were ones where you'd have to kind of shake out and you'd hit and all sorts of things would happen. And it would be really difficult. Either you'd get too much ketchup or not enough or you'd be covered in ketchup. And so they used a human-centered design approach in order to develop a new type of bottle, which is much more easy um, to extract ketchup from. So this approach and, and these ideas are very much part of our everyday lives and they permeate um, a lot of the products and services that we use today. So now I'm going to kind of bring you back to the mental health part um, and talk about the Catalyst Project, uh, which ran from 2018 until um, just about April of 2020. And this is focused on trying to improve the mental health outcomes of young girls uh, during pregnancy and the year after birth in Mozambique. And you can see some of our partners here on the screen and is a collaboration of, of many institutions. So me at King's and the Center for Global Mental Health are implementing partners um, at uh, the Manisa Health Research Center, or CESM, uh, with the Ministry of Health uh, at, uh, in Mozambique, uh, who were really great and open to this idea of a community-developed intervention for this challenge. And then finally, the, the design support from the Helen Hamlin Center for Design at the Royal College of Art here in London. And we had a really young and vibrant team that was really um, integral to building bonds with the young women and also with the wider community. And I think that that helped tremendously uh, in what we were able to achieve. So human-centered design can have many phases. This five-phase um, description is uh, a, a particular subtype of human-centered design called design thinking, and it's comprised of five different um, stages, which don't necessarily run linearly, but I'll describe them as such here. So the first one is the empathize phase, and that's where you kind of have a question or you have a topic that you're looking into, but you haven't really stuck on exactly what it is that you're going to do. So you go out into the community, you find the people who are the direct target of your solution or intervention, and in this case, it was adolescent girls, and then thinking about the other stakeholders and partners 
um, that are relevant to this. So their boyfriends or husbands and other family members that they live with in the household, um, because they're the gatekeepers often to allowing these young girls to access services. Um, and then the service providers themselves. So we worked with um, nurses and midwives and community health workers uh, at the, health, the local health center to better understand what they thought young girls needed and the challenges that they faced. Then we also were able, very fortunately, to uh, have individuals from the Department of Mental Health within the Ministry of Health who then could talk to us about the wider priorities for um, the whole population and for the nation in terms of, of mental health. We then coupled all of that learning and those insights from those stakeholder interviews and um, focus group uh, discussions with the desk research, so looking up the existing evidence for um, interventions around adolescent mental health, um, perinatal mental health, which is um, pregnancy and the year after birth, and anything else that was somewhat related to that. And to that end, we also did some service mapping uh, and mapping of the community to understand where were informal and formal uh, services for young people um, within the community so that we could better understand where an intervention might be best placed. And then lastly, we asked them, uh, the young girls, to take cameras home with them so that they could document their experiences and their reality through um, a guided uh, process. And then we brought them back together to talk about their photos and share their experiences. Now, all of this was triangulated in order to identify and define a priority challenge. So there are many things that the girls were dealing with. Um, and what we really needed to do was find a particular challenge that the whole community, all of the stakeholders could galvanize um, with. And then that would allow us to move forward to the ideate phase where everyone is uh, able to put together their ideas of how we might um, address this defined challenge. And so we had workshops and brainstorming ideas and, and sessions where we really kind of came up with all sorts of different ideas of what we might do. And then in those workshops, we refined those um, ideas down to things that we would then prototype. And this is where there's a difference to the kind of traditional research um, trajectory. And something that I find really valuable is the ability to kind of beta test and think about an intervention before you actually move to a pilot. So we're able to show people um, through storyboards or a mock-up or a role play what the intervention would be like so that they can tell us what are the things that they like and what are the things they don't like and how we can refine that intervention to make the most out of it. And then finally you move to the testing phase which is very much more aligned to kind of what we think about in traditional research in mental health, which is around pilot testing or randomized control trials and the like. And then, if everything goes well, we can think about scaling up. And hopefully by then you've got an intervention or solution that is optimized for sustainable scale and is something that then can be backed, backed up by the people who are delivering it. So the solution that we came up with, um, with our partners, was a motherhood skills course, which was designed with the young women to strengthen their knowledge um, about health and about their children and development, and also to build their skills, so interpersonal skills and problem solving skills in order to help them to build a better life. And like I said, the great thing is that this was a combination of current evidence and existing interventions, um, the goals and alignment with the priorities of stakeholders, and it was designed for sustainable scale. So that's all I've got for you today. I hope that you enjoyed that talk and found it useful. Um, if you're interested in the work that I'm doing, then please contact me on any of the things <laughs> in any of the methods that you see on the screen. Um, I have gone on to obtain and just start a new research project 
a much bigger one using these same ideas in another area of Mozambique and in Kalifi County in Kenya to start thinking about the generalizability of interventions that are developed um, at a grassroots level, at a community-based level, and how they might be relevant either um, within, a, within a country or internationally. So looking at all of these things I think are really important. And what I hope to leave you with um, is the idea that there, there, although this is a complex problem, we don't need just one type of expert to solve it. We really need pre uh, perspectives and expertise and experience from all walks of life uh, in order to come up with kind of the simplest and easiest solution, because often those are the ones that really stick.